Good evening, and uh, welcome to everyone tuning in to, to this uh, fourth week event for the Oxford Energy Society. This evening, we're going to have two speakers with us, Joe Rippon and Shikhar Sumit, uh, both working at EDF and both involved with the Sizewell C proposed nuclear project. To give you a little bit of background about our two speakers, Joe is uh, working as a finance and program manager. He's been working on the development of new funding models pertaining to the Sizewell C project. He also is involved with some aspects of the investor engagement. Shikhar Sumit is uh, also working as a program manager, and he has been responsible for work streams pertaining to net zero initiatives as well as wider uses of nuclear energy and also engagement with investors. And so thank you for joining us this evening, Joe and Shikhar, looking forward to your, to your talks. I think uh, to try and, and lay a little bit the ground floor for this event this evening, nuclear is uh, an aspect of energy which is sometimes debated, of course, in the wake of the 2011 Fukushima crisis. There has been a lot of discussion about its role parts of Europe have fallen to different sides of that debate. Notably, Germany decided to phase out nuclear energy. Other countries, the UK and France, have taken a, a more positive attitude towards it. Tonight, I think we'll be hearing more of a, a stance on the, the pro-nuclear case from the perspective of those involved with a new proposed project. And at the end, we'll go through a few questions that will come through the comments. Please feel free to put those questions into the comments and uh, I'll put some questions of my own at the end. So with that, I would like to, to hand over to Shikhar and Joe to uh, please begin uh, enlightening us. Ah, thanks a lot, Dylan. That, that's very kind. Just to check, can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. Thanks a lot. And hello, everyone. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here today and to be speaking about uh, nuclear net zero and what we are trying to achieve. Uh, just in terms of uh, what we'll be covering during this presentation, uh, we have set out a fairly high level summary here and we will be covering a, a mixture of topics uh, in the next 30 to 40 minutes. And essentially that would be a summary of uh, what we are doing, um, why we are doing what we are doing. And, and the reason why we think uh, in, Important, the nuclear is important for the next uh, few years and decades to come, and the reasons why we think that is the case. So the presentation itself, uh, we have tried to divide it, it into three different sections. So the first one is just generally uh, the role that nuclear plays in the wider net zero narrative. So I shall be looking at that. The next section that we have is uh, there are a number of different elephants in the room when it comes to nuclear energy. So Joe will be uh, taking you through uh, some of the issues which typically arise in terms of nuclear and the kind of questions that we face. And uh, Joe will be running you through those. And the final section of this presentation would be uh, in terms of wider uses of nuclear. So instead of thinking of nuclear just in terms of providing low carbon electricity, there are a number of other uses that nuclear may be relevant for as well. And we will be just taking you quickly through some of those wider uses also. So I think it would be a fairly quick and high level canter through uh, a number of these topics, which we have been looking at uh, in a considerable level of detail. And so very, very happy to field any questions, any comments you may have in the Q&A session, but equally also happy to field any questions and comments subsequently via email if you want to get in touch with us directly. So without uh, further ado, uh, if we begin with the first section in terms of the role that nuclear can play in a net zero energy mix. Um, a number of uh, the uh, fact statements set out in this slide may be familiar uh, to a number of you on the call already. So as, as you're probably aware, uh, we currently have the statutory obligation to reach net zero by 2050. So this is a binding obligation. It is something that has been laid down in statute uh, by way of an amendment to the Climate Change Act. So it is something that we need to do, we have to do. And as a matter of fact, it's something which is critical for our collective future because not achieving net zero, not achieving these ambitions means that there could be veritably uh, catastrophic effects 
uh, you know, just in terms of uh, in terms of the world as we know it. But in terms of actually achieving net zero by 2050, there are two really important things for us to keep in mind, and these are based on estimates actually run by the Committee on Climate Change itself. What we must recognize is actually by 2050, the electricity demand in UK may be twice of what it currently is. And we expect this electricity demand to double principally from areas such as you know, transportation and heat. But electricity in the future will be far in excess of what we're looking at right now. So that's one aspect of it. And the second aspect of it is if we are looking to achieve net zero by 2050, that also means that low carbon generation would need to quadruple in terms of where we are right now and where we need to be by 2050. And the point to keep in mind over there is we are referring to low carbon generation. So of course, renewables have a critical part to play in the mix. But at the same time, what we are looking at, which is nuclear, which is the focus of today's presentation, that again is a low carbon source, which is critical in order to meet those objectives. And as a matter of fact, there was a report published recently, as in just a couple of months back, uh, by this body called Energy Systems Catapult, which uh, is an independent uh, energy systems expert body, which is funded by Innovate UK, which concluded that in order to reach our net zero ambitions, uh, 10 gigawatts of uh, uh, gigawatt scale nuclear, so what is described as Gen 3 plus nuclear technology, which is similar to Hinkley Point C. So Hinkley Point C, of course, is a nuclear power project that is being developed right now as we speak in Somerset. They describe that as, as a clear decision, as a no-brainer of sorts. So it is something which uh, an independent body has recognized as uh, uh, important and critical to us reaching our net zero ambitions. But again, why is it the case that we need to look at nuclear in addition to renewables? And for that, just moving on to the next slide, the question is why can't renewables go 100% of the way? And the snapshot that I presented there is a snapshot in time. So it's a snapshot from 2018. But the key point that uh, that picture represents is there will be scenarios where, simply speaking, the wind does not blow or the sun doesn't shine. And the question is, what happens then? So what you see in that picture is in a scenario where the wind doesn't blow or the sun doesn't shine, we are relying on gas to exactly fill out the relevant shortfall in capacity. But at the same time, if you're looking at gas to fill in the shortfall in capacity, that really doesn't help us in reaching our net zero ambitions. So that is one aspect to keep in mind. The second aspect to keep in mind is where we are right now, most of our current existing nuclear fleet will be retiring by the end of this decade. So if you look at a current base load nuclear fleet going away. Uh, so which means that that existing low carbon base of generation will no longer be there. If you're looking at gas to fulfill that shortfall, and most of this gas, mind you, may actually be imported from outside of the UK, neither does that bode well in terms of our net zero ambitions, nor does it really bode well in terms of our wider energy security narrative. And the other point to flag is, uh, so this snapshot, of course, is from 2018. Uh, just out of curiosity, I was uh, looking at the figures from National Grid earlier this morning. And yesterday evening, I think around 8 o'clock, uh, National Grid actually issued an electricity margin notice. And uh, an electricity margin notice effectively is a notice saying that there is likely to be a shortfall in capacity. And the National Grid issued that notice because of low levels of wind generation as a result of which there would be a shortfall of capacity today. So it's, it's a very, very real issue. And with increasing levels of intermittency and renewables coming onto the grid, we need to ensure that there is also sufficient levels of low carbon base load, such as nuclear, which can meet scenarios where either the sun doesn't shine or the wind doesn't blow. And as a matter of fact, if we look at some of the examples set by other countries, which is uh, what we have set out here, and uh, there is this brilliant website actually called electricitymap.org, which uh, you know I would encourage you to go and visit because uh, that sets out a really interesting uh, uh, view of uh, 
the different uh, countries in Europe, uh, and as a matter of fact, in other parts of the world, and the levels of carbon intensity in these countries. And what you will notice is uh, the countries that are marked in green, so which uh, are the uh, high performers in terms of the carbon intensity levels, they're actually distinguished by uh, the level of low carbon base load in the systems. So for example, if you look at countries such as be it France or Sweden or Finland, uh, their uh, proportion of nuclear as a, a percentage of the generation capacity is 30% or above. So that is something perhaps uh, we as a country, as the United Kingdom should perhaps also be keeping in mind when we look at uh, our electricity generation profile uh, for the years and decades to come. Uh, so I think this was a very, very quick canter through uh, nuclear as part of the wider net zero narrative. I'll ask Joe to touch upon some of the elephants in the room now in terms of things which we ought to be keeping in mind and which usually crop up when we talk about nuclear generally. Yes, we thought it would be, thanks, Shekhar, we thought it would be remiss to talk about the case for nuclear without addressing the um, quite obvious, for some people, elephants in the room. They are, from left to right, the cost of nuclear, um, safety issues associated with nuclear, decommissioning, so the taking apart of the nuclear power station at the end of its life, and the waste that is produced by nuclear. And if I, we go on to the next slide, we'll start with costs. Um, and I just wanted to set a bit of context here by talking about what actually makes up a um, the cost to customers of electricity, what makes up their bill and the role that generators pay for that. And on the right of your screen, as you look at it, you can see um, the bill uh, wheel. And this is the various components of, of what customers, so people like you and I, pay in our electricity bills. And actually, the cost of generation is only a fairly small part of that. Um, 30, 40, 45% we have there. Other costs that make up the bill include the cost of managing the system, uh, making, it sh making sure it works on the second to second basis, uh, the cost of, 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 of making the electricity tra um, travel from where it's generated to where it's consumed. So these are transmission lines and distribution lines that bring it to your house. Um, and then the cost of retail suppliers. And the, the key point that um, I want you to take away from this is that when we think about the cost of different generation technologies, what we have to consider is how they impact the total bill that consumers face, because different generation technologies do have a different impact. Um, and I'll talk about that on the next slide. So the, the reason primarily that nuclear differs to low carbon technologies, other low carbon technologies or renewables, is, is the weather dependency that Shekhar talked about. Um, and that has an impact on customer bills because customers have to find a way of paying for the electricity to come when, the, when it's not windy and sunny, which might include storing um, electricity from earlier. We have to pay for um, electricity that actually isn't consumed when it is very windy and very sunny. Um, so that is effectively electricity that wasted. Renewables can be located further away from, from the places of demand, so they, they, they impose higher network costs. And as well as that, there are different costs associated with, with managing the system. But all in all, what we can see is that um, nuclear has lower, wider system costs than renewables. And this is demonstrated in the chart on the left here. Um, it was a study by Imperial College they ran a uh, power sector model out to 2050 to calculate the cost of decarbonizing um, the economy or the heating sector specifically under different pathways. And in the core scenario, you've actually got quite a lot of nuclear generating. And on the as an alternative, they, they costed a system without nuclear. And the system without nuclear has more renewables. Um, and the cost they assumed for renewables was actually 20 to 30 percent lower than the cost they assume for nuclear. Um, so you might expect it to be cheaper. But once you take account of all those system costs that I talked about, what you actually find is there's a deep level of decarbonisation. Despite nuclear on the face of it costing more, when you take account how it sits of how it sits within the whole system and the level of decarbonisation of the system, it actually produced a customer saving. Um, and if we go to the next slide. This, was actually, this has actually been considered in further de detail recently by 
by the government. So Bayes published their, an, um, a report on electricity generation costs uh, biannually. And on, on, in the table on the left, what you see is, is two versions of the cost of renewables. So on the, on the left is the, what the levelized cost of electricity. It's a measure you might be familiar with. Um, it's broadly comparable with uh, the strike prices, so the price of renewables that you will see quoted in the press. But what Bayes did for the first time this year was produce an estimate um, of what the true cost to, of, to the generation technologies is to consumers. And by true cost, I mean it, it included the wider system costs. And you can see there, it's in a quite deeply decarbonized scenario, when you take account of the system costs, then on top of whatever you're paying the generator, the 40 pounds a megawatt hour, you're adding 20 to 40 pounds, um, depending on the technology, for the wider system costs they impose on, on, on consumers. And it's important to note that those wider system costs are relative to nuclear. So that's a premium above nuclear that consumers have to pay. Um, but, you know, we must be fair about this. Um, it, it, renewables are cheap. So, so at the moment, the cost of renewables um, on a on a simple levelized cost basis is lower than nuclear. But then we have when we take account of the wider system uh, impacts, you can see why there's a case for nuclear in the mix from a cost perspective. So, yeah, I'll talk about the cost of our specific project on the next slide. So Sizewell um, is a direct copy of the plant that is currently being built at Hinkley Point C. And by copy, I mean it really a copy in quite an extreme sense. So, so the picture that you have, the artist's impression of the future size will see station. All the buildings coloured in green are an exact uh, replication of the, the same building that's been built at Hingley. And by exact replication, I mean it has the same um, same pipe, same wires, same pump, same valves. And the only differences are uh, well, there's, there's some stuff below ground, which is um, not particularly complex. And the buildings, which you can see that are different, the orange buildings are also not complex. They, they just um, have to be a di bit different because at the front, um, the buildings are pumping in tidal water and the tidal range is different at Sizewell to, to, to Hinkley in Somerset. And the building at the back is the, um, the fuel store, which has had to move uh, because the site's a bit smaller. But this replication, which you know, uh, in, we, is embedded in the psychology of the project, I would say, um, is really critical both for the cost and construction risk of the project. So on a cost basis, um, a large part of the cost of a nuclear power plant is actually doing the design. So if you like, um, uh, the architecture of, of the plant and the mechanical and electrical equipment that sits inside it. But because we've done all that, Finkley Point C, we don't have to do it again for size well. And that saves about two billion pounds. So it's about 10% of the construction cost. On top of that, all the suppliers that are providing equipment and materials for the, for the nuclear power plant have to go through an extensive and rigorous process to prove that the, the, what they're supplying is um, appropriate for the nuclear context in the UK. That costs another around two billion pounds because we don't, we don't have to do that again for size well. So in total, you can see that direct replication immediately saves four billion pounds and then the second benefit um, which has an impact on cost is the risk reduction and in very simple terms it's it's a very large um, relatively complex infrastructure project it is a lot easier to build it the second time and to have the same people building it the second time because there are there are vast opportunities for learning lessons benefiting from the experience seeing what worked well and what didn't work so well at the first project and in total, it provides a, um, a much greater degree of certainty about the outturn, construction cost and, and time. And if we go to the next slide, this construction risk is important for consumer costs because it um, feeds into the financing costs. So uh, the rate of return that equity and debt investors will require for the project. Because it's lower risk, they will fall. And to see how um, how important that is for the cost to consumers of the nuclear power plant. The chart on the right provides a breakdown of, of the Hinkley Point C strike price. So the Hinkley Point C strike price um, is £92.50 per megawatt hour of electricity generated. Taking that by its various components, um, around £11 of that 
was literally the the capital cost, so the twenty billion pound uh, or twenty one billion pound construction cost as estimated today. Twenty pounds a megawatt hour are for operating the nuclear power plant on an ongoing basis. So that's the cost that we paid each year um, of operation. And then the rest of it, so that's around sixty pounds, is to pay financing costs. So that is the return on equity investment and and debt interest costs. And of that financing costs. Um, more than half is due to the risk that is associated with uh, the premium you would expect to see at a, for, for a project of construction complexity and novelty of Inkley Point C. And what we're saying for Sizewell is that because it's a replication, because it's a second of a kind and, and the, uh, the people who are building it have already built the power plant five years earlier, we can take a large chunk out of that financing cost um, and by in doing so bring the cost to consumers right down. So if we go on to, I think, the next elephant, which is safety. Um, and, you know, I don't know what your perception of nuclear safety is, but what I can assure you is it's nothing like Homer Simpson. Um, the industry globally has a track record of 17,000 plus years of safe reactor operations. Um, and if we go to the next slide, talk about bits. Here's, here's a bit more evidence. For, for how that makes nuclear compare to other technologies. Nuclear, even when you take account of the incidents at Chernobyl and Fukushima, um, is actually one of the very, very safest uh, technologies there is. Um, similar to the renewables, um, incomparable really, well, far, far lower than, than things like coal and oil. Um, and it really does go to demonstrate that from a safety perspective, although we have um, negative per perceptions with the um, high profile incidents that have occurred, when you take into account the industry track record in the whole, it's an extremely safe way of generating electricity. Um, next slide, please, Shekhar. And that is a consequence of a number of factors. It includes um, very stringent domestic and international regulatory standards and requirements, informed by a vast amount of um, not only experience operating and building nuclear power stations by, by, by scientific research. There are multiple organizations, um, both internationally and at a sovereign level. Um, for example, the World Association of Nuclear Operators um, is an organization whose specific aim is to share knowledge between operators internationally um, with the aim of improving and, and enhancing nuclear safety standards. And what I can say is that from an industry perspective, it's quite unique because there are, um, that when, in that context, virtually zero commercial barriers. And, and it's, a, it's a very, um, provides a very effective platform for, for information sharing. And on the right, you can kind of, um, we've tried to, a bit of a quantification to show how uh, the safety standards that are embedded in our regulation. Um, the probability of an individual, uh, so myself, getting killed by a bolt of lightning is one in 10 million. Um, the risk of a large nuclear incident, so you might think of this a bit like the Chernobyl incident, is lower than that, you know, and the kind of probability that you're talking about there is comparable with an some, some estimates of extinction-like events where meteors hit Earth and wipe out the entire human race. Okay, uh, next elephant is decommissioning. So there are negative perceptions with the decommissioning of the nuclear industry, um, but actually quite a lot of these are rooted in uh, essentially a legacy issue to do with, with the early stages of the industry where um, a lot of nuclear activity was actually being conducted for military purposes. And to a certain extent, um, in an experimental context when we were learning about the industry, modern nuclear power plants um, are much more straightforward to decommissioning. And there is a very heavy emphasis on uh, designing the plant so that it is easy to take apart at the end of its life. Um, and you can see two examples there, uh, nuclear power plants in, in America where, where the operating site at, uh, at the end of its life has been returned to almost a greenfield in less than 20 years. And I can say that for our project in Suffolk and, and the one that's been built at Hinkley, um, you'd expect a similar timeline, around 20 years to return the site to its original condition. And my final elephant is nuclear waste. So one of the great things about nuclear energy 
is it's very high level of energy density. Um, and if we go on to the next slide, Shekhar, um, most, the vast majority of the radiation associated with nuclear power plants um, at the end of its life comes from the, the, the used fuel, the spent fuel. Um, and to give you an impression of the energy density uh, that actually is, is achieved by nuclear power plant, to, to produce enough electricity to um, supply an individual throughout their lifetime, you require a, a Coke can size of uranium to do that, enriched uranium. Um, and at the end of the fuel, uh, well, uh, the, the used fuel that would have provided all that electricity would fit back in that can. So in volumetric terms, um, it's, it's a really tiny amount for a huge amount of electricity. And what that means at the power plant level, we can see on the next slide. Um, so uh, this is um, uh, the artist impression of size we'll see that we looked at earlier. But the two buildings at the back are actually where um, most of the radioactive waste uh, or measured in terms of radioactivity is stored through the life of the project. And I said that the spent fuel is actually responsible for, for the vast majority of the radioactivity that the plant produces. That's actually about 95% or more of the radioactivity. And the building at the top left of the, uh, the site will store the entire 60 years worth of spent fuel. So that's, you know, 95% of the radiation associated with enough electricity supply to supply the whole of the UK for four years, for over four years, would fit in that building, which is about two football pitches in size. Um, and then the intermediate level waste is, is, is also waste that requires special treatment, but it's um, lower radioactivity, and that would fit in a building that's considerably smaller. Um, and, in terms of storing the waste, how it's done, if we look at the next slide, it's actually very um, simple in some in, in engineering terms to completely contain the radiation. So that spent fuel, which is the most radioactive material the plant will produce, um, when it comes out of the reactor, initially it goes into a into a pond for for five to ten years, and then it's moved into these containers that you can see. Um, this is actually the dry fuel store, so the version of the shed that I just talked about, but at Sizewell B, so it's the uh, the station that's currently operating next to the Sizewell C site. And in those canisters is spent fuel. Um, as I said, the most radioactive material that, that comes out of the nuclear reactor. And But the, those canisters, which are made of a combination of steel and concrete, contain the radiation so comp comprehensively that it's safe for people to stand next to them and touch them even. I think it's over to you, Shekhar. Jill, thank you. Uh, so moving on, the next section that we had uh, in the presentation this evening was uh, the wider uses of nuclear. And uh, so as, as Joe was mentioning uh, during his section, we at Size LC are looking to replicate what happened at Hinkley Point C. And as a consequence of that, there are a number of uh, costs and risk benefits we are experiencing as a result. But one of the other things, one of the other benefits also we are experiencing as a result is what we internally like to describe as brain space. So because we are copying large elements of something that is currently being carried out, we have the ability to think more about what we could be doing with nuclear energy. So nuclear energy, so as, as you know, so energy production in general can be divided either into uh, thermal sources or non-thermal sources. So thermal sources are essentially heat-based. So for instance, nuclear, where uh, in the case of nuclear, uh, as a result of the nuclear fission process, you produce significant amounts of heat, which then in turn interact with, let's say you have a steam turbine process after that, which is then used to generate electricity. So that is the typical process that a nuclear power plant goes through. But what we have been discussing is uh, how best can we actually utilize the heat that is produced from a nuclear plant so that not only does it produce electricity, but it can be used for other purposes as well. So the diagram that you see on the left-hand side of your screen, you will see there are a number of arrows there. So those arrows essentially represent energy flows. So for example, be it heat, 
uh, be it other aspects. So those are the arrows which flow down. Then what you see in circles are essentially technologies that those energy flows may be utilized for. And then uh, the bits that you see in rectangles are potentially end consumers of those particular technologies. So for example, if you look at hydrogen uh, as, as an illustration, uh, what we can potentially explore is one of the ways of generating hydrogen is by electrolyzing water, of course. However, what we could also do is instead of electrolyzing water, we could, apologies, uh, the lights in where I'm sitting right now have suddenly gone off. So all of a sudden I may be speaking in the darkness. Uh, so uh, instead of electrolyzing water, we can also look at electrolyzing steam instead. And if you look at electrolyzing steam, then that results in significant efficiency benefits compared to electrolyzing water. So that is one example of what we're looking at. Another example of what we're looking at is something called direct air capture. So direct air capture is a technology which can essentially be used to absorb carbon dioxide from atmosphere. So this in a way differs from, uh, so you may have heard of carbon capture and storage technologies elsewhere, but the way in which direct air capture differs from typical CCS technologies is because when you look at CCS, uh, they usually try and capture carbon dioxide from let's say either uh, you know, flue gases or uh, you know, other uh, uh, similar emissions which have relatively high proportions of carbon dioxide. On the other hand, the proportion of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is around 400 parts per million. So there are technologies currently in play which can look to uh, capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and which uh, and this particular technology is being regarded as literally being a game changer in terms of us being able to meet our net zero objectives. And one of the main requirements to actually drive this forward is the presence of heat. So you actually require heat, which has a key part to play in the adsorption process, which you know captures the carbon dioxide. And nuclear, a nuclear power station is a great provider of low carbon heat in significant amounts. So that is another uh, area we are exploring. And uh, the third bullet point which I've set out there is aligning with free ports. So uh, free ports is a policy initiative that the government was consulting on earlier this year. And essentially it would be a, a policy or regulatory regime to create a test bed where they could look at how to incentivize uh, both an innovative regulatory environment, but also make that work alongside uh, you know, other low carbon energy technologies and how to support decarbonization going forward in the context of uh, ports. Now, given the location of Sizewell Sea, which is very close to the coast, uh, that is again another arena that we can explore going forward. Uh, so for example, provision of low carbon heat or electricity uh, to ports in the vicinity. So again, like this was a very, very uh, high level summary of some of the different ideas we're looking at where uh, Sizewell Sea as a nuclear power station provides not just electricity, but a number of uh, other aspects uh, and flexibility to the system going forward as well. Um, moving on, uh, one of the other areas that uh, we are looking at right now is we are also collaborating on a project called Net Zero Layston. So uh, Layston is a town adjoining Sizewell. It's, it's a relatively small town. Uh, it's a town of uh, around uh, 5,000 residents. And uh, what we have been doing with a number of other stakeholders, which are uh, set out in, in the circle that you see in front of you, is to explore how we can work with the local community to arrive at a rigorous technology-based solution in order to drive uh, uh, and in order to enable this town reach its net zero ambitions. And the reason why this is a fairly unique and first of a kind project is uh, on one hand, of course, uh, like uh, there are a number of other parts of the country and indeed around the world which have announced their net zero ambitions. But what we have taken is a fairly ground up approach. So we are trying to look at specific technical solutions and to see how they can work together at a system level basis 
to enable Leiston as a town reach net zero. So we have been looking at individual approaches, say in relation to buildings, say in relation to transportation, say in relation to agriculture, say in relation to industrial processes, and how all of these can combine together to get uh, the town of Leiston uh, towards its net zero goals. And the other aspect also to keep in mind is, although it is a rigorous technical-based approach, one of the key uh, elements of ensuring that uh, a community-led project such as this can actually reach its net zero ambitions is also addressing the point of affordability. So there is no point in having lots of great technical solutions if those are simply not affordable or sustainable for the local community. So it's, it's a really, really interesting project because on one hand, it looks at these solutions from a technical lens, but it also looks at these solutions from a financial lens. And it also looks at these solutions from the lens of whether or not these would be acceptable by the local community. So this is something which uh, we have uh, been assisting on, we have been collaborating on for the last few months. And as a matter of fact, we have been pulling together a, a technical route map which sets out all the different pieces of analysis which have been carried out by the different stakeholders in this project. And we will be looking to publicize this route map fairly soon, as in hopefully by the end of this year. And we uh, hope and we will be making this route map open source so that uh, to the extent there are you know, other townships in other parts of the country which have similar ambitions, Hopefully, this can be a replicable model and a source of learning for those projects going forward as well. And finally, and I think this is my last slide, uh, uh, this is something, again, that we have been working on uh, for the past few months. And I would uh, uh, strongly encourage uh, all the different people, the attendees uh, to, to the session today and others who may be looking at this video later on to please go to this website called uh, www.energymixer.uk. So we have created this uh, game, which essentially puts you in the driver's seat. So it asks you, as a person who can create an energy mix for the United Kingdom as a country, and your objective is to keep the United Kingdom powered without producing carbon emissions using currently available and scalable technologies. So we are not looking at what may be available in the future. We are looking at what is available now. And using that, how best can we manufacture, how best can you pull together a mix which meets our various objectives? Uh, the other key bit which uh, we should have put on the slide is, it is not only currently available and scalable technologies, it is also currently available, scalable technologies at an affordable level. So when you go to the game, uh, and when you pull together your mix of technologies, what you will also see is you will see a bar which sets up the price of, of which that your uh, mix generates. And that, of course, is a very critical component in terms of deciding what the, uh, what the really optimal mix uh, for various energy types ought to look like. So uh, it'd be great if you are please able to go to this website. And um, if you have any thoughts, if you have any comments on this game, uh, please, please let us know, and you know we'd be very, very grateful to hear from you and and, and take your your comments uh, and, and like uh, refine uh, this 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 game uh, going forward as well. So I think that was probably it from Joe and my perspective in terms of uh, what we wanted to speak to today. But uh, as as we were mentioning earlier, very very happy to field uh, any questions right now, any comments, any thoughts. Uh, any feedback at all would be really appreciated now. Or if you want to get in touch with us separately later, that is absolutely fine as well. Thank you so very much. Perfect. Thank you very much for the talk. Very, very interesting. And uh, I should mention at this point that uh, Friends of Nuclear Energy, which is uh, the organization that's uh, also involved with this, uh, have provided an information pack, which I think contains some of the information of this talk as well as I'm sure more. And that's now available on the website of the Oxford Energy Society. It's uh, on the page with the term card next to the week for event. So for those who are interested, please go ahead and download that and read through the, the interesting aspects of nuclear energy which are discussed there. 
So we, we did receive a comment from someone. I think it's, I'll put it up. So I think it's really just a, a comment as opposed to a, a question. I'm not sure if it's, if it's meant to be a correction or just a, an addition to the discussion, but uh, pointing out that France reached plus 75% clean electricity by building 56 NPPs in 15 years at the cost of 100 billion. Um, any comments from that? Does that strike you as, as an important uh, statistic? I think it is an important statistic. Shekhar talked about the, the map at the start of the presentation showing the countries that have achieved decarbonisation on a kind of um, uh, permanent basis, effectively. Shekhar's chart that there are a couple of countries that stay green the whole time, no matter what the weather, and France is one of them. And it's because 75, 80% of his electricity is, is from nuclear power plants. Um, the, other, the other thing to say about that is the the statement at the bottom of there is that by building so many of them they did manage to achieve what um, we are trying to achieve at Sizewell which is to build a follow-on of a project that had gone before it so um, and you can see there were benefits in France when they when they built a series of the same reactors so so um, it's it's a good uh, reference on two fronts and we, we just received an update from Richard with part two of the question, which is, uh, why is nuclear more expensive nowadays? Can you can you talk on that? Um, um, uh, Joe, I'm happy to take that. Uh, it's So I think just also to add to what Joe mentioned, uh, one is, of course, uh, France building 56 nuclear power projects. And uh, in a way, the benefits that they derived are similar to the benefits that we are looking to derive. But also uh, the other part of it is, uh, as, as Richard mentions, in 15 years. So I, I think that shows that with, in a way, a clear policy direction and support behind uh, nuclear energy as a power source, the, the level of uh, you know difference and positive change that can be achieved going forward. So I think the French example is a really good demonstrator of that. But in terms of the second part of the question as to the current cost level of nuclear energy. Uh, I think that perhaps goes into uh, the slides that Joe was presenting to. So one of the reasons why the Hinkley Point C strike price of 92 pounds 50 was where it was, because it in a way was a first of a generation project. So Hinkley Point C was the first nuclear power project to be developed in the UK in in, in a generation, so to speak. And because of that, there was a significant level of construction risk premium attached to it. But as we build more, as we replicate the same technology, it would become cheaper, both in terms of the cost itself, because of the kind of efficiencies that we are experiencing and we know what perhaps to do differently and what is working, but also in terms of the construction risk. So that will also reduce uh, with the kind of investors who are coming in. So as a result of that, the more we build, the cheaper it shall become. And that is what the French example shows. And by building Sizewell C as a follow on to, more, as a follow -on to Hinkley Point C, and if we decide to build more nuclear projects going forward, that is hopefully what the UK example shall show as well. All right, thank you for, for that. So we have another question here. Um, <laughs> from what is almost certainly a made up name, pause for thought. <laughs> uh, is Hinkley C replicating any previous station that can be seen to be working or is Hinkley C the first of its kind? Yeah, so um, the reactor technology that has been built at Hinkley Point C is, is the European pressurized uh, reactor. Um, and there are other EPR power stations either being built and in China, actually, there are two operating. So it is a follow on to international projects, but it remains um, a first of a kind in the UK. And that's actually a really big point because the differences in nuclear regulation um, and health and safety regulation, fire regulations mean that when you when you move a reactor design to a different country or to the UK, you do have to do a lot of redesign work. So even though it follows its um, international sister projects. It is quite distinct. It did require that two billion pound of additional design work, you know, just to adapt it to the UK requirements. So um, 
so uh, that's not to say there aren't really important benefits from from following on the international projects but it is still quite distinct to those thank you and then we have another comment from uh, coming through from sylvester so he it's got two parts to it this is part one given that we consistently underestimate construction maintenance and decommissioning costs of nuclear do you think there may be similar underestimation part two in the comparison of system costs uh, pertaining to Joe's slides. Um, Joe, I think you should go for it. I think that's okay. <laughs> So, um, a, a kind of, yes, the, the challenge on construction cost um, underestimation is a valid one. But what we are saying is that Hinkley, um, in particular size, well, as a result of it being a follow on project to, to projects that have followed, you really do have a huge amount more cost certainty on the construction front. When you look at what's gone wrong um, on a, from a construction perspective at nuclear power plants that have, uh, you know, there are plenty of bad stories. That's why it's an elephant in the room. Um, there are very common reasons for that, and, and it includes dramatic underestimations of the amount of work that's required during the construction phase at the time of the cost estimate. The uncertainties and, and issues that are encountered from building a design of the for the first time um, and um, you know doing anything for the first time is difficult so so that is why we've had big overruns on, on other nuclear power plants in terms of maintenance uh, we have we, you know the operating costs are 20 pounds a megawatt hour we, we've got we're very confident in what they are they're informed by many many years of um, reactor technologies of a similar type operating in the USA and France. So, you know, I don't, I really don't think there is much uncertainty on that. The decommissioning uh, cost is, is a, is an interesting one. In the UK, we, we for legal reasons, uh, it's a legal requirement that we provide a very, very detailed um, plan for the decommissioning phase of the project and the waste management plan of, of the project. And that has to be fully costed on a very conservative base. So, um, and it has to be funded. We have to put in place an arrangement by which it will be funded through the operation of the life of the of the plant. So when when you see the Hinkley Point C power price that people are paying, that ninety two pounds fifty, that includes an allowance to meet um, the costed decommissioning activity. And it's about three pounds a megawatt hour. Um, and although you know decommissioning costs previously may have been underestimated, we know a lot more about what it would take to decommission in B point C. And as I say, you know, it, it, we, we have to put in place um, a detailed plan about how we're going to do it and we know what requires to be done. And perhaps just to add to what Joe said, in a way, the nuclear industry is unique in terms of having to put this fully costed decommissioning plan in place. As in, it's something that we have to do as in, for example, we have to do that for Hinkley point C. Uh, we will have to do that for size will C. But that kind of requirement literally as in it's something that is unique and bespoke to our industry. So it's it's again something for us to keep in mind. This is something that we do have to make provision for upfront and, and something that we you know need to put into place. So that's perhaps something else to also keep in mind in this regard. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, and then we have a, a further point from from Kevin who's apologizing for missing the first half of the talk. You missed great stuff there, Kevin. Um, so he's wondering how much of EDF's organization slash design pr procedures considers contemporary approaches and mega project management. I guess the question there is about sort of what steps have been taken to bring in best practice when it comes to you know, a, a development of the scale and if size will see goes ahead, what, what you're doing to make sure that's the case. Uh, should, I, should I take this, Joe? <laughs> yeah, you go first and I'll go. I'll, I'll... Sure. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. No, I think I think that that's a really, really good question. And in, in answer to uh, the question, uh, it I think it's it's a critical part of of where we are in terms of uh, looking at best practices from other mega projects. And as a matter of fact, uh, there was actually a paper published uh, just about uh, a few weeks, about a month or so back, which sets out an ambition to reduce costs up uh, by by thirty percent. Uh, in terms of you know where we are right now and where we want to be going forward and and the way to do so is by identifying a number of critical key enablers that we think are 
relevant and necessary to drive the cost levels downwards. And the way in which these key enablers have been arrived at uh, has been exactly as was mentioned in the question by looking at the examples of mega projects elsewhere, things that have worked, things that have not worked, and things that we should be looking at taking into account uh, while progressing these projects going forward. And, and the other point to uh, flag is this, uh, the cost reduction ambition is not specific to Sizewell C alone. This is at a more generic level for the entire nuclear industry. And it is something that the industry itself is coming together to work on and to borrow learnings from other mega projects. And uh, so uh, the report itself is actually publicly available online. So if, uh, if it's of interest, we can send across a link to that report. But, but in answer to that question, it learnings from elsewhere, best practice from elsewhere are a, a critical component. And it's something that we are actively engaging with in terms of looking at how to reduce our costs downwards going forward. All right. Uh, Joe, did you want to add to that? Uh, no, I think Shek has given a very comprehensive answer. I mean, um, some of the great things we are doing from a from an innovation perspective are there's, there's a huge amount of digital digitization of the construction activity that is undertaken. So we build the entire plant um, in a as a digital twin first in a, in a 4D model, um, and then and then before anything happens on site. So. So people have, have kind of practiced doing it and, and made and identified in advance where things have gone wrong in the digital model and, and they can avoid it when they when they get on the strike. So so there's are some really good examples of innovative approaches to construction. And then uh, so we have a further question from from Richard, who I think was the first to pose one. Uh, you obviously have someone here who's very much in support of your, your initiative. He's asking, why does the nuclear industry not push for 100 percent nuclear? <laughs> His point being that uh, some renewable ad advocates argue that uh, we should be trying to move towards a 100 percent renewable grid. And uh, I guess keeping in mind the carbon footprint he thinks that with with nuclear uh, we could perhaps do as well. I guess maybe another way to think about that is is maybe how much nuclear could we have on the grid? You're obviously talking about trying to go ahead with size. We'll see if that happened. Would you say that's about as, as much as the UK would need? Or would you think that you know, more is necessary? Or, or can, maybe you can speak to that. Uh, my personal view is is certainly that, that more is, is necessary. Um, it's certainly, I think, I can say with a great degree of confidence, we wouldn't regret building more after size we'll see. Um, if, we, if we think back to one of Shepard's first slides, which was what it takes to get to net zero. Um, and it, you, that, that forecast, which came from the Committee on Climate Change, has a doubling of electricity demand from today to 2050. And if you bear in mind that everything that's operating today, with the exception of size will be, um, will have closed by that point. That is an enormous amount of electricity generation that has to be built. So to um, and to fill that gap, uh, frankly, you can't just do it with nuclear, and it's not sensible to do it. Offshore wind and solar have, have achieved big, big cost reductions. So so they have a um, a very significant role to play, and probably providing sixty to seventy percent of the electricity in the UK in the, in, the, in the future on current costs. Um, and it's it's a bit. So why, why don't we say it should be 100% nuclear? Because I'm, I, I'm not sure it's feasible or sensible um, and it's unnecessary. We, you know, we, we focus on getting size well built and the industry should focus on on getting um, some more projects after size well built. Uh, trying to do to power the UK in 2050 with 100% nuclear is, a, is several very large steps on from that. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be. No, I, I would actually fully agree with what George has said. And, and in a way, also, if you think about it, there are synergies to be had between, say, nuclear and renewables. So, for instance, what nuclear provides is base load capacity to the system. What uh, renewables provide is intermittent capacity to the system. So you can have scenarios where, let us say, where the wind doesn't blow or the sun doesn't shine. You have nuclear, which makes up the shortfall. On the other hand, in a scenario where the wind is blowing and the sun is shining, that same nuclear, instead of providing electricity to the grid, can be instead used to provide uh, hydrogen or can be used to capture carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So there is, there is a really nice, uh, in a way, a symbiotic relationship which can be brought into the picture. 
Uh, and also, as I'm just going back to one of the earlier slides, uh, by the modeling analysis carried out by Energy Systems Catapult, they were forecasting around 50 gigawatts of nuclear, which may be necessary to reach our net zero targets ambitions by 2050. So definitely, in answer to the question posed, I fully agree with Joe that you know we need more nuclear. But in terms of there probably is also a balance to be struck between nuclear and non-nuclear to get us to where we need to get to. And then we have a further question, uh, a follow-up from, from Pause for Thought. Uh, he is interested in the embedded aspects of carbon, embedded carbon in the construction of stations and how those are basically offset by the, the supply of low carbon electricity. Can you maybe talk briefly about um, the embedded carbon involved with uh, the construction of a nuclear power plant and how that is offset by the low carbon um, production that, that follows and the timelines which are required, you know, for that to make sense and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. Um, it's important, uh, you know, when, when you think about what it takes to build a nuclear power plant, there are huge amounts of concrete, steel, um, other bulk materials and, and lots of activity on site, lots of transportation. So, so there is there is a large amount in absolute terms of carbon emitted um, during the construction phase of the project. But when you compare that to the amount of low carbon of electricity that's generated over the project's life um, in a per unit of electricity generated uh, statement, it's actually quite low. So um, nuclear compared to other renewables, uh, there is an IP international intergovernmental panel on climate change uh, study, which shows that nuclear is pretty similar to, to wind and, and actually quite a lot lower than solar. Um, of about 10 grams per kilowatt hour. And if you compare that to gas, gas, when you take into account the carbon associated with getting the fuel and moving it to where it's burnt, is 500 grams. So that's that's 50 times more than nuclear. And in terms of what that means for, for kind of offsetting the construction emissions uh, once the plant starts operating, well, we, we did a calculation for size as well, and we, we um, estimate that compared to a gas plant, compared to burning gas, it would take about six to eight months before before the carbon that is is emitted during construction is offset. And that, so, six to eight months um, in the context of a sixty year operating life, you're kind of talking about less than one percent of of the plant's uh, life lifespan. Yeah, that's an impressive statistic. Okay. So that uh, that brings to the end of the the various questions that we that we received. Uh, thank you again, Shikar, Joe. Very very interesting. And uh, yeah, thanks for spending your evening teaching us a bit about uh, about nuclear in the, in the UK. And You're very uh, welcome. Well. It's good fun. Okay. Thank you. All right, and that concludes this uh, this broadcast. <laughs>